Can you hear me, John? Yes. Great. Thank you. I can, I can. Mr. Mayor, can you hear us? I can hear you. Right. Oh, I see. Go oh, ahead. Let me go. Let me unmute my owner. Todd, can you hear, sir? I can hear you. Great. Hey, Mayor and Todd, John, I'm here. Good. I don't look as good as you guys, so I, I yeah, do radio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I broke old Joe McCone's grand grandchildren's heart today. Um, and Mr. Mayor, if uh if you want to speak, sir, uh, just let me know. We can get you added to the list. But um, if you're having trouble unmuting yourself, just type in the chat or, uh, or email me, and I'll make sure you get unmuted. So there, you go. there you go. Got it? There you go. Yep. There you are. Who's in charge of this operation? <laughs> <laughs> I better, mute, you I, I better mute myself here, get myself in trouble. <laughs> well, obviously it's not me. <laughs> well, I, I can hear you, John. I don't know who else is out there. Yep. What is it? The declaration. We're still waiting on a on a couple people here. We need the senator and and Sean and Adriana emailed us and let us know she may be uh, a little late. She's uh, had a two thirty call with the governor. Yeah. For those on the call right now, we wanted to thank you uh, for joining us. My name is Tristan Cross, and I'm with the United Corpus Christi Chamber of Commerce. We're still waiting on a few of our, our participants to join us on the call. So if you just give us a few minutes. Um, if there are any questions you have, again, this is an update on reopening Texas set for this Friday. Um, don't hesitate to either type them in the chat feature if you're on Zoom or by emailing them directly to me. My email is Tristan, that's T-R-I-S-T-O-N, at unitedccchamber.com. Again, thank you for bearing with us. Just give us a couple. I'm unmuted, Tristan. Okay, we got you.
Hello. Senator, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Right. So who are we waiting for? We are just waiting with uh, waiting on John from the court uh, and uh, Adrian okay. with the governor's office. Okay. John, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Why don't we since we've got both the senator and Todd on, and we can pick the rest up as we go on. So um, uh, I'd like to uh, start it. I think we should. Um, thank you all for being here today. As Tristan said a few minutes ago, uh, Governor on Monday laid out a program, a uh, phase program to uh, open Texas and um, there's a lot of different components to that and a lot of different time schedules. And we thought uh, at the chamber that for the community and for business, especially the small business, uh, it would be appropriate to try to give them some, as much information as we can. So this is the first in what may be a series of these on opening Texas. And uh, I'll, get, I'll get right into it. I'll ask um, Senator Hinojosa if, uh, if he would be our our lead off here and I think everybody on this call and I see we've probably got about 120 people already and they're still coming on know the senator and his commitment to uh, to South Texas and to our region whether it's in the port economic development education uh, human services and keeping an eye on the budget uh, for all of South Texas he's always been there for us so, senator uh, why don't you start us off? Well, first of all, uh, a thank you to the United Corpus Christi Chamber of Commerce for hosting uh, this conference on opening the coastal bend. Uh, I think we all can acknowledge that uh, none of us have ever experienced a pandemic uh, like coronavirus uh, that we're experiencing right now. Uh, and quite frankly, it pretty much uh, devastated uh, our economy. Uh, with our small businesses shutting down, uh, people having to be uh, laid off, uh, not having money to pay their bills, uh, their rent, uh, live bills and food. So it's a real challenge. Uh, and uh, as we try to find our footing and our way to uh, get back our economy back on its feet. Uh, and, and, and it's very painful, uh, obviously, as we try to open up uh, our economy slowly but surely. I think uh, Governor Abbott has taken a very conservative approach uh, to make sure that we don't uh, end up uh, having a worse um, situation than we have presently uh, under the pandemic. Uh, but at some point, uh, we need to move forward uh, and open our economy. Uh, and the way I will start first, I, I would like to make three quick points uh, because it's very important. Uh, it, it is obvious that our small business businesses are the backbone of our economy. Uh, and uh, most of them, quite frankly, are shut down, uh, except for uh, necessary uh, and essential businesses. Uh, so I want to talk about the CARES Act real quick, because I think that's extremely important. The CARES Act has a component for small businesses uh, called the um, Paycheck Protection Plan. Uh, it's to help small businesses, uh, American workers, in the healthcare industry. It was $349 billion uh, to help businesses uh, keep some of the employees on payroll. Uh, and that money went real quick. Uh, and part of the challenge was that the guidelines were pretty loose and a lot of that money didn't quite frankly focus on the small business community. Uh, some of the corporations uh, that didn't need the money were able to get in uh, and get millions uh, uh, loans uh, that some of them are having to return back to the federal government. But the second bunch uh, of money appropriated under the CARES Act, another $310 billion, uh, had different guidelines where the focus is on small businesses. 
And the reason this is important is that once you lay off your workers, trying to get them back is a challenge. Uh, and this way, uh, the workers will have sufficient money uh, to pay the bills uh, and, and be able to at least survive uh, until our businesses can open. Uh, but also small businesses uh, are, if they spend those monies and funds of their loan, uh, then that money uh, will, will be forgiven. It will be turned into a grant. Uh, for example, uh, if you spend the money, if you get a 10, let's say a $1 million loan, if you spend 75% on salaries uh, and the other on interest or mortgage payments uh, or, or utilities, uh, that money will be forgiven. Uh, so it's a big help and a big price for our small businesses as, uh, as we struggle to open our doors again. Uh, but the other, the other part of what's happening is uh, for us as we try to help our small businesses get back on their feet, uh, Texas was allocated $7 billion to help with corona-related expenses. Out of the $11 billion, uh, $6 billion went to the state. $5.4 billion went to the locals. Uh, out of the $5.4 billion, $3.6 billion went directly uh, to the counties and cities over 500000 which is $175 per capita for each. It's based on population. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, that left only about 1.8 million billion uh, for the rest of the state uh, and the other counties and cities below 500,000, uh, which will get about that will qualify for approximately $55 per capita. Uh, and that money is also to assist our local governments uh, with uh, corona-related expenses. Along the same line, uh, as you all know. This is really uh, an event uh, that none of us anticipated, uh, just pretty much knocked us off our feet. Uh, and many of the state agencies were unprepared. Uh, and I'll focus on the Workforce Commission uh, because initially, uh, quite frankly, the Workforce Commission was just overwhelmed uh, with a number of claims for unemployment uh, to the point that uh, in a two month period, they were trying to process claims that normally takes over two years to process. Uh, so we quickly uh, adjusted uh, and added probably uh, around another 500, 600 employees uh, to help out volunteers from the center staff people uh, uh, and committee staff to help out answering calls. And the Workforce Commission answers approximately uh, 1,200 uh, calls a day. I'm sorry, 700,000 to 800,000 calls a day. And they're open seven days a week from early morning to late at night. As of yesterday, the Workforce Commission the process uh, over 2 million claims. Total payments to unemployed people was $2.9 billion. So we try to pump money back into the economy so that, because this money will be spent on basic necessities of life uh, and hopefully once we take the step uh, of opening our business locally, uh, and the, tomorrow's a big day, uh, because we, we will be allowing to the executive order issued by Governor Abbott uh, that most businesses can open uh, with some qualifications and restrictions uh, at 25% capacity. Uh, they will probably be measured uh, by the fire marshal uh, so that you have 100 people capacity, you can only have 25 people, uh, but that's work in progress. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'll pass it on, uh, John, to my good friend, uh, Chairman Todd Hunter. Okay. We'll get to the question. We'll get to questions, but uh, as uh, the Senator said, uh, Representative Hunter, who's um, led us through quite a bit of this, whether it's uh, the coronavirus or Hurricane Harvey. Um, he's always been there, not just for his district, but for the entire coastal bend. Uh, so he doesn't need any introduction more than that to the 170 people on this call. So Todd, uh, please. Thank you a lot, John. And thanks uh, to the Senator as well. From the state side, we work as a three person legislative delegation. 
and we are in constant communication. And then we also, just so the listeners know, the legislators have a weekly call that represent Aransas, Nueces, and San Patricio. So it's a pretty good coastal bend uh, communication and team. And uh, you know, I want to thank the Senator also. I'm speaking on behalf of Representative Herrero. He couldn't be here. So my comments are a joint on behalf of Abel and myself, as well as the Senator. And uh, he uh, is also working on these issues and and we all talk uh, almost daily as it comes. But I want to thank the United Chamber and all the chambers that are out there, and especially the governor's office who uh, agreed to be part of this uh, conference. And uh, I know the, the mayor and the council in our county are, are working as well, and everybody communicates uh, together. You know, we thank the businesses and, you know, we got to thank the people and the businesses, but we also want to thank the medical and health folks. And as the Senator brought up on the loans and the SBA, we want to thank the banks and the credit unions and the financial institutions who've been out there really working to try to do everything they can to, to help on the finance side. Let me kind of uh, go into an area that the Senator talked a lot about on the financial. Let me cover some other areas, and then I'm sure he and the rest can add if I miss some areas. Let me kind of go to some specifics for everybody listening. So the governor announced on Monday a three-phase plan. Tomorrow, May 1st, is phase one. So the senator said, business is open at a 25% limit capacity. Now, in particular, the governor indicated that this is not mandated to open. The governor indicated for businesses that want to open, that's a 25% capacity. So let me give you an example. So May 1st, tomorrow, we open up. Let's say you're a restaurant. Number one, be sure to go to the Governor of Texas website under the Open Texas Guidelines. Because a lot of the services that you may be providing as businesses, there are specific pages of guidelines that are to be followed. So we're opening at 25%, but there are specific guidelines that have to be followed. So let's take the restaurant. As the Senator said, a restaurant that has 100 people capacity. 25 can be in there at one time. You can still do to go, you can do drive through, you can do pickup, but inside 25%. So that 100, you can only have 25. But you've got to know the guidelines. The guidelines for employees that you've got to have the medical health care standards followed. The Center for Disease Control, social distancing. They're going to need to have certain sanitizing stations in the restaurants. They have got to have disposable menus. Condiments are supposed to be brought to the table. So I want everybody to know it's not everything is regular. There are some health components. And then if you're the attendee, the guest, the patron, when you go in, you can only be in groups of six or less. The social distancing six feet apart must be there. And you've got to be able to keep those health practices. If it's a buffet style, it's not us going up to get the food. It is the employee serving you. So if you're in that particular food service business, make sure you know the guidelines. And if you're gonna go, make sure you kind of know what the rules are with the 25%. Another group are libraries and museums. Now, some of the museums are not ready to open locally. One of the reasons is there is a clause guideline that says no interactive activities. So I think, for example, some of our attractions and events 
are probably going to wait till the next phase of phase two or close to that, or even maybe later. But there are some restrictions on interactive. Now, here's a an example. It's my understanding the South Texas Botanical Gardens is going to open tomorrow. It's considered an outdoor museum. Now, they can open, but there are guidelines under the governor's website for museums and libraries. So for example, they have to provide sanitizing stations. They are going to have to have certain things open and other things not open. Social distancing still needs to be followed. There will be exhibits or buildings that still don't open up in the phase one. But I do know they are because I have worked with them and conferred with them. But I want to give examples of what tomorrow is. To quote the governor, this is not a rush to the gate opening. It is a phase one with guidelines. And I also want you all to know that some people will still stay at home. They have the opportunity to do this. This isn't a mandate to rush everybody outside. And then you're still going to have essential versus non-essential services out there. Let me go through some specific issues. I've been getting a lot of questions on beaches. I know uh, the mayor, I saw that he was on. I'm sure he has. The mayor of Port Aransas, the county uh, judge, the county commissioners, the council. Uh, I'm sure the senator and Abel and myself let me tell you about beaches. The General Land Office at approximately 5.15 p.m. last evening announced that beaches open tomorrow. They open tomorrow. Now, you got to follow social distancing. You're supposed to follow the Center for Disease Control guidelines. And the GLO indicated that if a local government wants to restrict a beach area or set a timeline curfew or restriction, then they're to get a hold of the GLO, the General Land Office. But beaches do come open tomorrow, and that was announced at 5.15 last evening. I've been getting questions about pools, swimming pools. Well, we're in South Texas. You'd think we'd be able to jump in the pool probably quicker than some of the other areas of the state. Public pools were announced to be closed. We learned today, dealing with the city of Port Aransas who inquired, uh, they were contacted by one of the health agencies in Austin. And they were told hotel, motel, HOA, homeowners associations, RV park pools are all closed. And the reason is it was defined any pool used by multiple families or users from different households is considered a public pool. So I want everybody to know phase one, pools aren't generally open yet. Another one I got a question from is childcare. And I wanna make sure everybody knows that childcare operations may remain open for children of essential service employees. They have not defined yet the child care for non-essential. And that's because we are in phase one. This question was asked of the legislators today and one of the health departments responded to all of us today. So I wanna make sure everybody has a little bit of clarity that phase one, May 1st, yes, it's an opening with guidelines. It's not a rush to the gate. And that's why I want folks to kind of know what the guidelines will be. Now, I do want to make sure that everybody knows that some counties tomorrow can open up at not 25% capacity, but 50% capacity. And the 50% capacity are for counties that have had fewer than five reported coronavirus cases. So 
there is a different standard if you've had five or less. I know many of you have been asking, there has been no decision in phase one on barbershops, salons, bars, gyms, tattoos, massages. The governor said that they are reviewing that with the health folks and they are being reviewed. Now, whether they make a decision or wait till the next phase, I don't know, but they're not open yet. The next phase is May 18th. May 18th is called phase two. And on phase two, same thing as May 1st generally, except you can open at 50% capacity. And then phase three is probably in a June time period. There will be some opening up of things, but they haven't really specified the dates. So overall, that's kind of a overview of what's about to start tomorrow. The original stay at home executive order expires tonight at 11.59 p.m. And the new executive orders then go into effect. And I'm gonna tell you, there are a lot of areas that are still probably unclear to you. And the uh, advice I can give is contact the Senator, contact me, contact Representative Herrero, uh, contact uh, the city and the county governments. But if you need help, let us know so we can make those inquiries and try to get some clarity. So far, I think that the governor's strike force with communication with our area has been pretty good. Uh, they've uh, really reached out and uh, they've gotten us information. Some of the information we all may not be thrilled with, but uh, everybody's going through that and that's because we're going through phases. But the communication with their strike force, I think has been pretty good. I did have somebody, uh, a local business, who's a great friend asked, what about, is there a person or contact that we can go to to get an answer? Because a lot of folks may be saying, well, I got the center, I want to open at 25%, I got to make sure I dot all the I's and cross the T's. Right now, I don't have, unless the senator has a specific contact, I know some inquiries have gone to Sam Susser, who is on the local strike force here, but you can for right now contact us and we'll try to get those answers for you. But overall, uh, those are the phases. Uh, the governor said he wasn't going to mandate face wear face masks, but he did say they strongly encouraged it, strongly use it, because they do feel that there's a health component and medical component there. So John, let me stop there. That's kind of an overview. And I know, I don't know if Adriana Cruz from the governor's office is on yet or, or will be joining us. I do wanna thank their economic development area because their economic development area has been in great communication with our whole coastal bend zone and all our coastal counties. And I do wanna thank her for uh, reaching out and being available to help us. So I'll stop there and listen. Okay, I think Adriana is on the call. I see her name up yes, there. Yes, I am. Great, and Adriana is the executive director of the governor's office of economic development and tourism a longtime practitioner of economic development in, in Austin and in San Marcos and now for the entire state. And we've had a strong relationship in our community with that office for economic development with all the good things that have happened in our community. And now um, this is a little different role, but we are certainly glad you were able to join us, Adriana. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Representative Hunter, thank you so much for your for your kind words. Um, uh, I'm sorry that I'm joining you late. Um, I, I was a little bit late getting off of a, a phone call. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to be with you here today. As uh, was mentioned, I'm the Executive Director for the Economic Development and Tourism Division um, in the Office of the Governor. 
uh, 20 plus years of experience in economic development at the state, local, and regional level. I uh, was at the Austin Chamber of Commerce, the Greater San Marcos Partnership, um, and prior to that was part of the uh, staff at Governor Perry's office um, in the Economic Development and Tourism Division as well. Um, I was appointed by Governor Abbott to this position uh, December 2019, uh, so have uh, been in the position for about four, four or five months, um, but it's my great honor to be leading uh, economic development efforts for the state of Texas. Uh, on uh, April 17th, Governor Abbott appointed me to the strike force to open Texas. Um, I'm one of the members of the Special Advisory Council, and I'm also the co-chair for the um, group, the work group on workforce development, economic um, recovery, and international trade. Um, one of the first things that we did on um, Friday after the governor's announcement was we immediately got on the phone and started calling industry associations across the state um, from restaurants, manufacturing, um, all of the, the industry sectors, uh, the chambers, our regional economic development partners as well, uh, because we were trying to get input from our Texas businesses um, as we look at this very careful and very uh, methodical and very strategic opening of the state's economy, um, how can we do it? How ready um, are you, restaurants, um, to be able to open at what capacity and what sorts of safety protocols have you all thought about? Uh, what safety protocols, you know, we want to maintain the social distancing and the things that have worked uh, to keep Texas and to keep our state out of the um, very high a number of hospitalizations that we've seen in other states. Uh, luckily and, and fortunately through all of our work and through all of us working together, uh, we have avoided that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why as the hospitalization rate um, did not reach those levels, we're now looking at, okay, let's look at this phased approach to open the state's economy as Representative Hunter um, outlined um, look at certain segments, uh, certain industry sectors that could open first at a limited capacity, still maintaining social distancing, still maintaining um, good hygiene, hand sanitizing stations, sanitizing workstations and, and uh, work in ver um, environments. Um, and then, you know, looking at that data uh, and then looking to what, what comes next. Um, as we gathered all of this input, and I want to thank um, uh, hopefully some of you uh, responded. I know that the, the Coastal Bend um, Regional Advisory Council and Economic Development Organization helped us to kind of send that out across your region so that we could get input, um, not just from different companies, different sizes, different industry sectors, but also different geographies of the state. Um, we took that input, put it in a plan and ran that by the four uh, medical experts who Governor Abbott um, asked to sit on the Special Advisory Council to get their medical advice and input on what could be deemed um, safe, uh, what sorts of plans would have to be adjusted or modified. Um, and then as May the 1st uh, comes, comes along, we see some of these openings take place. And as Representative Hunter said, this is not requiring companies to open. It's if they want to open and if they want to start the process of sorting easing, easing back into, into this. Um, we're going to gather data. We're going to look at metrics, um, the positivity rate, the hospitalization rate. Um, if those metrics stay um, within a, a percentage um, that the, the medical advice we're receiving is, you know, th this is a good rate, uh, then we will look at, at phase two, um, as Representative Hunter mentioned. Um, right now, I mean, the strike force has been working, you know, seven days a week, 24-7, uh, gathering this industry input, putting it together in a plan, putting it in front of the, the medical panel. Um, we are continuing to evaluate other industry sectors, um, other uh, input that we're receiving from um, other industry sectors as well. Um, so this is the process that we're following um, and we're, we're hopeful that we can uh, continue to protect Texans' lives. Uh, the health and safety of Texans is of paramount importance. Um, and while at the same time, 
protecting their livelihoods as well so that people can get back to work um, and we can help some of our small businesses that have been um, in, in very dire straits um, since this started. Um, with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you all may have or uh, provide any other information. Um, but again, you know, I appreciate all of the feedback that um, you all as a regional group have provided. Uh, please, if you have other suggestions or other thoughts, or if you have a plan for your business, uh, please, um, as Representative Hunter said, um, contact their offices. You can contact the governor's office as well. Um, you can contact uh, uh, myself and my office, um, and, and we will take a look at that. Um, that. That is how, you know, we're going through this process is just sort of, you know, utilizing everyone's input, taking that input, um, and, and uh, putting it together into the plan. Um, I hope that all of you uh, have been able to download uh, the governor's report to Open Texas. Uh, that has all of the information as Representative Hunter went through all of the checklists of what the businesses um, are being asked to do and then also what the customers are being asked to do. This is a, uh, a, a compact, if you will, between customers and businesses to protect each other. Uh, to make sure that we're, we're operating safely, that we are opening our economy in, in the safest way possible. Um, and so some of these rules, uh, this is not, you know, business as usual. This is business in a, in a modified way, at least for the time being. Um, and I've heard this described as, you know, this is not a light switch turning on. This is a, a dimmer switch. So we're, we're slowly easing into uh, an opening of the economy. And hopefully if, if everything, all the metrics uh, stay, stay uh, within um, the, the means that we are determined and stay safe, then we'll continue to open and continue to open and go from 25% to 50% as, as Representative Hunter described um, and keep adding you know, new industry sectors um, so that we can um, try to get uh, the economy uh, back to the, the number one economy in the country that it was before. Uh, thank you, Adriana. I really like what you said about the compact. Uh, you know, we, we all focus on the businesses and what they have to do and how they're going to handle this, but a lot of the responsibility falls on all of us as citizens of Texas and as customers of those business to make sure we behave in a in the right way in, in the prescribed way and in a safe way so uh, don't forget don't just lay it all back on uh, the business that you're going into take the responsibility yourself um, I know uh, Mayor McComb I think is still on the line if he is I'd like to uh, give him a chance to make some comments on what's going on as the city uh, opens up tomorrow. Mayor, you're still there? I'm here, yes, sir. Go ahead, we'll give you the floor. Well, I mean, we're getting indications that some of the restaurants are gonna be opening and others, they're gonna wait until the 15th. I think they can use this two week time period to get their inventory re up, rearrange their tables and see which is the best way to meet that 25%. Uh, I read one article or one lady just, I mean, they said theirs, theirs was so small that 25%, it wasn't worth it. They're going to wait till 50%. But, um, you know, the, um, the interesting thing is going to be the psychological uh, barrier that some people have to get over. There's, there, there's, there's some folks that probably aren't ready to get out and they don't have to. And that, so they, they need to feel comfortable that they can stay right where they are. Uh, but, uh, I, I can tell you that there's a lot of people that I've run into that uh, that are anxious to get back to work. Uh, they're anxious to, you know, kind of do something besides sit at home and clean the garage. Um, but the, you know, the good part about, and I don't know about the rest of the state, I think the state overall is in pretty good shape, but in New Aces County, the, the, the citizenry really has responded positively. We've got very low numbers here in in uh, Corpus Christi, New Aces County. And so um, uh, we're trying to, you know, we want to keep that and we hope people will continue to do that. The burden's going to be more and more on the, the locals' response uh, than it is going to be on the leadership of the elected officials now because they've got some responsibility. And, 
I, you know, the governor's very kind and gentle, but I, I, I detected he was pretty firm that if the numbers start going uphill, we're, we may be back at home. So, and I don't think anybody wants that. We've got to get that message out. So, um, but at, uh, at the same time, I, I think people are really excited and uh, I hope that we can move forward because there's, um, there's a lot of kids that are going to miss a high school graduation. If it goes back up, I think they're planning some summer graduations, but that's a big time in their lives and their families' lives. And, and many kids in South Texas, they may be very the, the first one in their family to graduate from high school and to miss that graduation is going to be a real uh, a downer. So I hope that is able to be pulled off. Um, but uh, uh, Todd, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, the strike force. Uh, we had three good people up there. At least they were familiar with Corpus Christi. Jeff Hildebrand was up there and Sam Susser and, and Bob Rowling. So I was talking to Mr. Hildebrand today because of his South Texas beef and he's, uh, he, he's very aggressive out there and doing what they need to do to make sure they stay safe. And he feels confident they've taken the right steps uh, there. And, and uh, he, he was uh, wanting to make sure that we knew that he was interested in what was going on in Corpus Christi as well as other places. So, um, and he's got a lot of confidence in the governor's uh, task force and the strike force, the people that he's getting information from. He's not flying by the seat of his britches by any means on this thing. And so I think that's why you're seeing a lot of people very cooperative with what he's doing is they, uh, they're they paying attention to him. He knows he's got a good, strong team behind him. So um, Peter at the city is, you know, some of our libraries are not going to open right away. They're trying to get their tables rearranged, see what they can use, what they can't use in the library. So it'll be a phased in. Um, I did uh, <laughs> send Representative Hunter a note when he said the swimming pools were closed. I thought maybe he'd, like to, he'd like to call over and explain that to my grandkids. <laughs> but uh, uh, people are... Um, I think they're looking very optimistic and I think they're going to be very uh, uh, cautious and moving forward fast, but I think they are looking forward to, to being able to start moving and taking the train out of the station. So thank you for everything y'all have done. You guys have been great to communicate with and we're going to continue to do that. And um, we've, we think we've done, we haven't done everything right because we don't know whether it's right or not. We, we we've tried to do everything right. Uh, but uh I think we've had a great team in Corpus Christi and New Aces County uh, trying to communicate and, and do the best we can for our citizens. Thanks, Mayor. And I, I would agree. I think the, uh, you know, the key thing in what we're all going through is that people know what's going on. And you and Peter, the county judge, uh, the county health director have certainly provided uh, all of us on a daily basis with, uh, exactly what's going on. So it's, I don't want to say because it's not comforting, no, but, it, but we know what's going on. It's not that we're wondering what's going to happen. So I, I think from the chamber and from the business community's point of view, we really appreciate the effort the city's uh, put into it, especially you and Peter. I think you guys are doing a great job along with council. Thank you. Uh, we do have uh, uh, Sean Strawbridge, who's CEO of of the port and um, Sean and I were talking a couple of weeks ago what a a great first this was before even more than a couple of weeks you lose track of time but what a great first quarter they were going to have and everything was rolling along and then uh, this hit both with the Saudis and Russians uh, screwing around with uh, with oil and then with the coronavirus and and everything coming to a stop and uh, Sean's been gracious enough with us a couple times to give us an update on the port and energy. And if you haven't seen it, go to the New York Times. There's an excellent story there on the port in, in the New York Times, which Sean uh, uh, is quoted uh, extensively, and it, it really lays out what's going on. But Sean, uh, uh, take it away. Thank you, John. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to give an update, certainly on what's going on in the energy industry. Uh, and before I get into that, I, I, I want to thank Senator Hinojosa, uh, Representative Hunter, uh, Mayor McComb, certainly Adriana from the governor's office, because I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's really a, 
a collaboration of business and government working together to get the wheels of commerce turning again. And there's no real kind of centerpiece for any economy than a port. And we're very fortunate to have a, a sizable port right here in South Texas and in the, the coastal bend. Uh, and you're, you're absolutely right, John. Uh, when we were talking, we started off the year extremely strong, had re a record quarter in the first quarter. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, the pandemic hit and we've seen some significant demand destruction. And what I was hoping to share with some of your, uh, the, uh, the, the folks that are participating on the call, I'm going to try and share this screen. And you tell me, John, if, it's, uh, if you got it or not here, if the folks can see it. Can you see this uh, screen here, COVID-19? Yes, report, eighth yep. edition. I can see it. Great. Uh, so this is a report done by a company called Rystad Energy. Uh, they're a Norwegian-based company, but they've got a fairly sizable energy practice based in Houston. And this has come out of a collaboration between their international group and their energy group here. Uh, this is the eighth edition. They do this update every week. And this is an abbreviated version of what came out just yesterday. I will share uh, just the, uh, the executive summary and then get into a little more detail. I've highlighted in this executive summary what I think is important. Um, certainly, Reistad believes that the infection rate globally is much, much higher than what's been reported. And that's probably a factor of the testing or the lack thereof. Uh, having uh, significant testing available on a per capita basis continues to be a challenge for sovereignties around the world. Um, there is no indication in their estimation that a herd immunity will be realized in the next 12 months, which is about what it's going to take to come up with an estimated a time frame for a, a, um, uh, an inoculation uh, of, for this, uh, this virus. Uh, and so why is that important? Well, we've seen significant demand destruction as a result of the COVID-19 no travel, stay at home, shelter in place protocols that have been put in place globally, and that has taken an estimated 28 million barrels out of a global 100 million barrel a day consumption. That's taken about 28 million barrels out of that. And that's obviously very significant, historic. And so if we move on to what they believe the likely global infection today is, it's about 10 times, a little over 10 times what the reported cases are. Uh, 54 million is what uh, Reistead Energy believes is the actual infection rate globally. Uh, this chart shows all these different bubbles are different countries, and it shows them where they are in the fatality, uh, the death rates. And the good news is those bubbles are coming down. So we're starting to see uh, a reduction in the fatality rate. Not necessarily the fatalities themselves, the number of fatalities, because remember, fatalities are gonna lag behind actual reported cases. Uh, but the good news is you're seeing some fairly sizable uh, regions like Europe and the Indian subcontinent. Their fatality rate is uh, coming on to the, uh, the downside, which tells us that they're flattening their curve. Uh, and you can see here some of the curve flattening here. Some are doing better than others. We're all going to get to the same place. It's just a matter of who's going to get there faster and have a quicker flattening out and who's going to be more on that hockey stick tri type trajectory like we're seeing with Japan right now. How does that impact global demand? Well, as John said, we had you know, two black swan events. We, uh, three, if you count Tom Brady going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But two, the one was obviously COVID-19, and the other was the market share war that erupted at the exact wrong time between Russia and Saudi Arabia. Uh, they have since, we call that OPEC plus, that's the OPEC countries, plus a few other producing nations. Uh, and they have decided they're going to take 10 million barrels of production off of the market. Um, but what you see here in these, uh, these two charts, the top chart is, of course, we see the reduction in demand from what it was at about 100 million barrels a day to what it is here in April, which is somewhere around the low, to low 70 million barrels a day. And the bottom chart is, of course, that lost demand, those lost barrels. And why is that important? Well, the producers were still producing. So we're seeing a huge oversupply. Just because we had this acute demand destruction in a very short period of time didn't mean that the producers could just turn the wells off immediately. 
So what we're seeing is tremendous demand for storage and a tremendous surplus of crude oil, which is gonna take some time for the world to actually consume. Uh, and that's important for us and gonna be impactful for us right here in Texas and certainly right here in, in Corpus Christi. Um, again, talking about some of that demand destruction, you can see here global aviation activity is starting to flatten out. It's starting to hit that trough, if you will. A year ago, 100,000 flights a day globally. Today, 21,000 flights a day. That's at over 80% uh, demand, uh, about an 80% demand destruction in global aviation. Road travel, uh, ground transportation uh, is faring a little bit better. Uh, and we're seeing here the, the colored bubbles that are heading down and to the right. Uh, as the more they move to the right, the more we're actually recovering demand. And the distinction between the black uh, clear bubble that you see and the colored bubble is where they were last week. So we're starting to see some good separation there. We're starting to see some improvement in ground transportation, ground demand. Uh, gasoline, motor gasoline has seen a fairly sizable hit. Diesel, not so much because our, our supply chain and our transportation network, our commercial and industrial transportation network is still moving goods, including vessels coming here to the port, rail and truck and so forth. But this is a good indication that we may be hitting that bottom and it's right a good time with the governor's uh, open Texas plan uh, to be able to start taking advantage of certainly those low gasoline costs. Um, road, uh, road fuel demand in April is down 33%. Jet is down 70%. This is uh, global demand. Uh, all other fuels only down about 14%. What does that mean though for the energy industry? And we're going to start with those global investments that have been made. And you can see the different sectors of oil production here. And you can see how those investments have changed over these different annual cycles. Remember the big downturn in 2014, 15, even into 16, we started to see that uptick in investments uh, in, in oil production in 2018. And then you see there the pre-drop CapEx estimation. We've seen an adjustment in what's gonna be invested in the energy sector globally of about 25%. It's a minus 24% reduction. That's companies like Exxon and Chevron and Oxy and others, and I'll actually go to who they are and by sector here, you'll see the majors there, $17 billion worth of capital reduction programs. You'll see the sovereign oil companies, uh, Aramco, Saudi Aramco, Equinor from Norway, Petrobras from Brazil, and the China National Petroleum Company, $15 billion. In the shale, the shale is the third largest sector where you're seeing significant reductions in CapEx. And that's gonna affect us right here in Texas as the largest shale producer. And a lot of jobs in Texas and certainly jobs here in Corpus Christi are tied to this particular sector right here. And we don't know how much, if any of that is gonna come back. We know some will, but we just don't know how much. Um, the good news is there's still globally going to be service sector revenues of about $515 billion globally. That's a half a trillion dollar uh, revenue market this year. Um, but, you know, it's anybody's guess at this point, and you heard Chairman Hunter and you heard Adriana say, it's not going to be a mad rush to the door for everybody to open back up. It's going to be measured. So we just don't know what that recovery is going to look like. And therefore, it is anticipated that we're still going to see more bankruptcies. We're going to see more job loss uh, here in Texas for sure. But the good news is it looks like we may be seeing the bottom. We may be seeing some moves up. And I want to share one other slide, if I can, with you uh, that just talks about, um, let's see here. Well, I don't know how to drive this. Let's see here if I can click on this. Can you see this slide? It's a new slide, John. Um, no, not yet. Not yet? Yeah, not yet. I, some of us can't. OK, where it says Houston, Beaumont, Corpus Christi, and Louisiana, and these different sectors. Can you see that? Yes. OK. So what this is is the amount of crude oil that's been exported from this region this year. You can see Houston's done 105 million barrels, Beaumont's 55 million, Corpus Christi's 158 million, and down here at the bottom, Louisiana's 25 million. And then you can see 
just week to week here, you can see from April 3rd to April 24th, we've really actually shown a bit of, an, of, a, of a steady, if not a little increase. So we haven't quite seen the impact here yet. The reason for that is because a lot of the crude that was sold was already sold at higher prices or it was hedged. But it will come as we see those surplus stocks that are hitting those tank tops, as they call it in the industry. And that's not what I'm wearing underneath my shirt here. That's when our storage capacity reaches capacity. That's when we start to see real problems where there's no outlet for that crude production to go. Uh, and we estimate that we'll be at tank tops or full onshore capacity sometime in early mid-May, which means then the only other place to put production is either to shut it in or to put it on vessels for storage. So we may see a, a little uptick in our volume here at the port and with the port workers uh, and our customers in loading those vessels that then become those floating storage uh, facilities. Um, if I can just pivot, John, one second. Let me, uh, let me see if I can stop sharing now and just sure, go, go back ahead. to my, uh, my unshaven mug here. Uh, I am happy to report that the Port Commission last week uh, approved an increase in our promotion and development funds. Uh, and we've seen a tremendous amount of, of requests from not-for-profits in the area that we traditionally support who have not been able to hold their fundraising activities. And the result of that is we're able to give more money uh, to some of those uh, folks and perhaps even some more of those entities. We've got a tremendous amount of, of requests going on right now. What we are certainly advocating is rather than having these large gatherings for fundraising, just work on virtual fundraising uh, because you'll reduce your cost and you're, you'll certainly be able to, I think in this day and age, as, as Adriana said, having that relationship between the customer and the, and, the, and the business, that goes for charitable organizations who do a tremendous amount in our community uh, as well. They're feeling the pinch also. And so I'm happy to report that the Port Commission has increased our amounts that we can spend in this community. It's almost another million dollars. Uh, and I just wanna thank, uh, thank them. And if you do see them, uh, feel free to give them your thanks as well. That's all I have, John. Uh, that was great, Sean. I think we, uh, we all learned a lot there. And uh, I just saw just a question for you uh, before I turn it back to Tristan for questions from the audience. Uh, saw something in the last day or so that there were 24 VLCCs off the California coast and 13 in the Gulf with Saudi oil waiting to get into U.S. Uh, facilities. So there's, there's still stuff going on out there, isn't there? I guess you got the, uh, the, the controls on the, the mute button there. Um, uh, there's, there certainly is. A lot of that is Alaska North Slope production that finds its way to the Southern California Refining Center. Uh, and so Alaska here again had to find these outlets. And so their traditional, uh, their traditional outlets uh, it had, was, uh, was, was certainly clogged. Uh, we've got about 15 ships off of the Texas coast uh, that are full, that are waiting, uh, because certainly crude oil today is trading at the spot rate, uh, which is the rate you can buy crude at today is lower than the futures rates. That's called a cantango uh, type of situation. That's an imbalance in the market. That's not a healthy market. And so what happens is they'll sell the crude at a futures price, put it in a vessel and just hold the vessel offshore and pay the vessel costs until that futures contract matures and they'll, they'll make money on that, that ARB there. Uh, but certainly the Saudi Armada, as I have heard it term, that's coming this way with arguably somewhere between 15 and 20 million barrels um, that, that certainly is a bone of contention for the administration. The Saudis have actually sold that, as I understand it, with a tariff included in the price. Um, and so there's certainly some consternation that's going on between this administration and the Saudi government. But also understand that the largest refiner in the United States, single refinery in the United States, is the Motiva refinery in Port Arthur. And that is owned 100% by the Saudis. And certainly it is their prerogative to... Uh, source their own feedstock for that. But yeah, there's a lot of geopolitical impacts that are going on in our industry. And uh, certainly whatever those are, proration is gonna be considered by the, the, uh, the Texas Railroad Commission next Tuesday at their hearing. It, it looks like it's gonna be, it's gonna come down to uh, Commissioner Craddock because uh, 
Chairman uh, uh, Christian has already come out and said he's against. Chairman Sitton has come out and said he's for. So I'm going to bring popcorn because it should be some good theater. <laughs> yeah, an unusual theater, too. I hadn't been there since the 70s. Yeah. Uh, okay, Tristan, I'm going to turn it back to you. Do you have any, uh, any questions for, from the audience? I do have a few questions here from our members. I'm going to try to make sure all of our participants are unmuted. So if you have the uh, ability on your end, um, or if they do, I'm sorry. Oh, Adriana's unmuted. Uh, just feel free to uh, to speak up if, if you uh, would like to respond to any of these questions. Uh, first and foremost, um, for those uh, being asked to return to work uh, but have children at home and Again, this is for non-essential businesses. What options do they have? Um, it, that, uh, I'll answer that in terms of child care. That, that's correct. Um, so child care is one of the issues that's being um, looked at now. Uh, child care is still being provided for essential workers. Um, and uh, my understanding is that some of those child care providers um, there are um, openings available and slots available, um, but uh, we understand that have asking people to return to work without um, having childcare options um, is, is challenging and difficult. So that is something that is being discussed at this time. Okay, thank you, Adriana. Um, there's nothing else, we can move on to the next question. Um, in terms of right now, as, as, we, as beginning tomorrow, we, again, we have the 25% capacity um, in terms of, uh, of patrons going into restaurants and other stores. Are there any limits to the amount of staff that can return to work? Is, uh, again, this is not for non-essential businesses such as restaurants. Are they under any type of limit uh, as staff? Um, my understanding is that the 25% is for patrons and does not count um, employees. Thank you so much for that. Um, and again, I, 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 for those who, who joined the call, is there a limit to the size uh, for each group uh, eating at a particular restaurant uh, entering a retail store? And, and uh, to follow up on that, are the rules different depending on whether a business is a restaurant or a retail store? So the, um, the, the intent of the guidelines is that people continue to um, social distance and to not congregate. Uh, for restaurants, um, there is a, a six feet distance between tables but the group, there can be a group of six people sitting at one table. Um, I don't believe there's a, any such limitation for retail, um, although it, the, the general idea is that people going into retail are going to be within the same household um, or individuals alone, um, but that is sort of what they are uh, trying to do is to not encourage um, people to to socialize or congregate and and for our for our legislators on the phone is there any plan currently or, or any discussion being had about expanding our state's testing capability on a large scale particularly including those who aren't showing symptoms yes Tristan, and yeah. go ahead adrian tristan on our end we can't understand you it's getting muffled and breaking up so adriana must have a clearer line um so in regards to testing and tracing um i am glad that that question got asked and there is sort of a echo i don't know if anyone else can hear that or if it's just me um but part of the uh, plan to open Texas is, uh, does involve an increase in testing and contact tracing. Um, the governor's plan is calling for 4,000 uh, people to do contact tracing um, to, in order to understand um, who has tested positive and um, where they have gone and who they've been in contact with to try to, to contain uh, those that, that um, test positive. Um, and, and to contain the virus uh, from spreading further. 
Um, so there is part of the plan is this uh, uh, desire to um, increase contact tracing and testing. And uh, in fact, one of the questions, it may have been um, one of the statements that the, that the mayor made, I did want to uh, include that, that that is part of this plan. And um, some of the questions that are being asked as far as, you know, numbers of groups, the contact tracing, all of that is in the report, um, along with checklists for each type of business, uh, what sorts of things they have to do, the safety protocols, the size of the groups, and then for the customers as well, there's a checklist. Everybody give me about two minutes and I'll be on the call. Thank you, Adriana. Um, sure thing. Uh, another question from, from our members. I, I understand we only have a couple more minutes here. Um, was there any guidance uh, issued uh, in terms of, of weddings or meetings or events? Again, these are not these are not businesses. Is there how how do you determine how many people are able to attend something like that? So um, meetings, events, large gatherings are you know still uh, not encouraged. Uh, uh, Places of worship and uh, churches um, are allowed um, following, again, those social distancing guidelines. Um, but all of these things, meetings, events, are, are being looked at uh, possibly for future phases. Um, I think once we have sort of uh, started this first phase, it's important to, through the testing and the tracing, get that data, see where we are before we move on to um, larger groups. Um, one word about the, the testing, and I think um, Representative Hunter or Mayor, you may have alluded to this. Um, as we increase our, our testing, we're going to increase the number of, we're going to see an increase in the number of positive cases because we're testing more people. And the, the concern is not so much the total number of cases, but the positivity rate. So of those tested, how many are positive and what is that percentage? So that, that's the metric that is gonna, you know, so I'm just trying to manage expectations. As we increase testing, it's likely we're going to see an increase in the total uh, aggregate number of cases. Uh, but what we wanna see is what the percentage is that test positive. And, and a final question I have, um, we have a number of employers who, uh, who are um, worried that um, whatever, whenever tomorrow and moving forward, whenever they can hire, bring back more and more staff that they're worried that they're, uh, those staffers may not want to come back, um, particularly because of the increased unemployment benefits um, we've seen with the help of the, the federal government from the CARES Act. Um, what would you say to those employers? Is, is this something where Will those employees, regardless of their, their fears of, of COVID-19, will they still need to return to work or risk? So this is a question that gets asked. Um, I've been participating on a lot of virtual town hall meetings and webinars with the Texas Workforce Commission. Um, and usually, and we've been doing small business webinars as well uh, with one of the attorneys from the Texas Everybody Workforce out. Commission. Um, one of the uh, things that's been said is, is if an employer has an employee who is offered to return to work and the employee says, I would rather not return, I'm getting more money here, so, and not because of any physical reason, uh, but just doesn't return to work, um, that would disqualify them from unemployment benefits. Unemployment benefits are paid to people who are are unemployed and, and are um, unable to get a job. So if a valid offer of employment is offered, um, then, and they refuse that valid offer, then they are not, they don't qualify for unemployment anymore. Um, they, that does need to be documented and TWC has said that you should make these offers in writing via email or something so that it can be documented um, and then it can be reported to the Texas Workforce Commission. Now, if there's a valid uh, reason, a health reason, um, I think that each of these cases, you know, need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but I would absolutely reach out to the Texas Workforce Commission um, to ask that question. Adrienne, I want to add, since you brought up the health, and by the way, thank you for breaking 
uh, your schedule to be with us and you and Senator Hinojosa, Sean and the mayor. One thing, Tristan, that I want everybody to listen and if you have ideas, as everybody said, we're going into phase one, we're going into phase two and phase three. And let's, let's be real honest. We're gonna have some economic, what we call speed bumps. And a lot of people have been in, in cabin fever. One of the issues that we want the strike force to hear and we want Adrian and the governor to hear is the importance of mental health, mental health support services. And so if folks have ideas and thoughts that's something I would like to encourage because, you know, we need to keep everybody uh, shine the light in any darkness and help anybody we can. And that's an expansion of the health side of the question, but it's something I want everybody to kind of work on. And it may be a topic of a, another call. But I, I want to thank you all. I've got to break off to another, but I want to thank everybody. If you need anything from me, please please contact me. And Senator and Representative Herrero, our, our delegation, appreciates everybody on this call. Thank you, Adrian and the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hunter. And um, Senator Hinojosa and Mayor McComb, and I'm going to have to drop off as well, but I, I appreciate um, being invited and being asked, and, and we're here to help uh, in any way that we can. Uh, Texans and and Coastal Bend, I know, are no stranger to, to challenges um, and, you know, coming together uh, just as we do after natural disasters, that's how we get through and, and we're going to come out of this as well. Thank you for your time. I think we're probably uh, done. We ran a little bit over, but I liked um, Todd's idea of something on stress and mental health. We may look at doing that next week. I know the U.S. Chambers and the Texas uh, Association of Business have done a couple seminars on that. So we will look into that. I uh, also want to thank Senator Hinojosa for, uh, for getting on this call, Mayor Sean and Adriana for uh, taking time and we will talk to you all next week. Thank you very much.